I'm based in Tromsø in Norway, um, uh, in northernmost Norway. It's actually 400 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle and is pretty much as, as different place from Sri Lanka as you can get. Um, in exactly 10 days, the sun will set. And it will be away for two months. No daylight. But instead we can get to enjoy these beautiful auroras, northern lights on clear nights. The upshot, of course, is that in summertime, the sun never sets. What we don't talk so much about is that the average temperature of July is plus 12 degrees, but uh, it's beautiful to look at. Um, I'm running a group of developers in Tromsø, and one year ago we were a pretty much a traditional uh, C-sharp JavaScript shop. And then we started a process to learn functional programming. And today, the whole group is doing functional programming and functional programming only. And we're really excited about it. And that's why I'm so happy to be here and tell you about, about this journey. Um, this is not going to be a technical talk. This is going to be about the foundations and the fundamentals of why we think functional programming is so important and why it's, is, uh, why it's worthwhile studying. Even if you're not going to use a functional language, it's good to know about it. <clears throat> um, and it's never too late to learn. My oldest developer turned 60 two weeks ago. And uh, he's spending his day writing functional code. And he's happier than ever. So functional programming, what's sort of the, the very, very short version of it? Why, what, what is it? We all program with functions, right? Well, sort of-ish. Uh, in functional programming, we have a very strict definition of what a function is, and anything else is a procedure. A procedure is a computational recipe. A function is a function in a mathematical sense. You don't have to be a mathematician to do this, but it's, there's a very strong distinction. A pure function is a function which takes only inputs or a single input, it can be a complicated one, and produces a single output, it could be a complicated one. It does not have any communication with the outside world. It does not have access to any variables and global variables, global state, or anything. It has the property that you give it an input, it produces an output, it's a black box, and it does so, give the same result for the same input every time. It does so today, it does so in five billion years. It can never ever give a different result to, to the same input. That's a pure function. So some people would say that, well, that's a, sort of a little bit boring. Um, I say it's, uh, stable and consistent, and I like that in my programs. Um, the other thing with functional programming is that functions are first class, and that means that we don't really make a distinction between functions and data. We, tr we can treat them just the same throughout the whole program. There's no difference between functions and data. And this is a bit mind-bending before you get used to it. Um, and then we have higher order functions. That means functions which take functions as inputs and might return a new function. Which means now we have suddenly code which can, can manipulate functions at runtime and produce new functions as we go along. And this is a very, very powerful technique. It takes some time to get used to, but once you, you get the hang of it, it's, it's really great. And the last point I have here is immutable data. Because in order to be really strict about pure functions, you cannot have variables. So, so when you're doing really properly functional programming, you do not have any variables. You set the value, and it has that value for eternity. Now, this sounds like a horrible, horrible, horrible uh, restriction. And, and you think, how can you, can, ah, we have to have variables. We have to have it. We can't work otherwise. But it turns out that this is one of the most important aspects uh, of, of functional programming. It also forces us to think about loops in a different way, because we can't have loops. 
Because in order to have a loop, you have to have a loop counter, and what's a loop counter? Well, it's a variable, and, and we can't have that. So we need to come up with better ways of looping, and, uh, and I'll show you some examples in the next session when we're gonna get a little bit more technical. So, uh, just a quick sort of about what we're doing in Tromsø and, and why. We're using a language called F-sharp. So I said we were a C-sharp shop, um, and we switched to a language called F-sharp, which is a strongly typed, functional first, object-oriented language running on the .NET platform. This F-sharp is developed by Microsoft. It's open source, uh, fully supported by, by Microsoft, complete support inside uh, vi um, Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code, Xamarin Studio. So, so it's very easy to, to use uh, and, and start using. And the good thing about F Sharp is that since it's on .NET, the users and the programmers, they don't have to learn a new set of libraries, a new environment, a new everything. It's all .NET. Anything in .NET they can use. Anything written in C Sharp or VB.NET, they can use directly in F Sharp. And vice versa, anything we write in F Sharp, we can use directly from any .NET, be it VB or, or um, or C sharp, and that's a huge advantage because we can get productive very, very quickly. At the heart of all of this is this very good statement from uh, Tony O'Hara uh, during his Turing Award back in 1980. He said there are two ways of constructing a software design. One is to make it so simple that there are no ob obviously no deficiencies, and the other is to make it so co complex that there are no obvious deficiencies. The first method is far more difficult. And what this statement is about, really at its heart, is complexity. Writing software is complex. And now, when talking about complexity, we need to be very sure that we're not mixing sort of the two, two important aspects of it. First, we have complexity inherent to the problem. Inherent is Latin, and it means not your fault. And that's the problem specification. Doing quantum mechanics is hard. Really. And if you make a slightly improvement in the complexity of quantum mechanics, you improve the theory and make it easier and simpler, you're most likely to receive the Nobel Prize for it. And we want to write software. So that's maybe not where we should spend most of the sort of effort. The other part of complexity is what we call incidental complexity, incidental to the solution. Incidental is Latin and means your fault. It basically boils down to the languages we choose, the tools, even the hardware. As soon as we introduce a computer, I mean a computer is a massively complicated thing. I can do quantum mechanics on paper and pen and it's complicated, but then, whoa, a computer, and now I need to sort of match these two things up. It adds enormous amounts of, of, uh, of uh, complexity, just the hardware. The editor is a complexity. I have to learn it and it has its quirks and its bugs. And our programming language. So what happens is that you, with complexity, we get all these unintentional interactions and things to doing with I.O. and state, and it's all very complicated. And the question is, what can we do about it? Can we do something about it? And I think this is sort of a little bit ironic, at least most projects I have worked on. Um, you start a new project, week one, you produce 5,000 lines of code. And you sort of project to the future, and you go like, oh yeah, well, this is, this is, we're gonna be done in two weeks. And two weeks later, you know, development speed has halved, and it's like, well, okay, another three weeks, perhaps. And as we go along, it gets slower and slower and slower, the progress. And the reason is, of course, that the complexity of the system, it's getting larger and larger, and we change things, and we have to go back and rechange, and then, ah, oh, that stopped working. Oh, yes, of course, ah, oh, well, I was a bit stupid, and ah. Oh. When in reality, when we think about it, when we start a project, we should, it should be really slow going because we have nothing. And, and then as, as we sort of build up our, our model, our problem, uh, problem domain, 
we should get things faster and faster. And at, at, mo at least it should be linear. It should sort of be flat. We should have the same speed all the time. Um, that, that's the least we could hope for, really. But instead, it sort of drops. Because complexity gets us. And it's not just your software. I mean, all the libraries we're using, everything that we bring into our, our software, there's, ah, there's a bug in that, and oh, that isn't, I know that doesn't fit the new version. Oh. So, but I'm going to talk today about how the particular language that we're using, how it affects us. Now, when you bring in a new programmer language, you need to sort of, how, how, do, you, how do you assess it? How do you judge it? Is, it? is it good? Is it bad? What should we look for? And um, there are three key things to look for in a programming language. One is what is the means of data representation? Is it like JavaScript? Everything is JSON, uh, objects, so on, so on. How, how do we represent data? How do we model data? Uh, what are the means of composition? How do we put smaller things together to make bigger things? Uh, and finally, what are the means of abstraction? How can we generalize things? And um, so, so the rest of the talk will be really about looking at these three topics in, in some detail and, and look, look at them. Uh, when it comes to data, I, uh, I will do the simplest, simplest data I can find, and that's a single value. Um, variables. We all know this. We're programmers, right? X equals X plus 1. This, this here was really born, that we do things like this, was really born out of this. 64K RAM. This was a big system, by the way. Uh, and after you load up your, your compiler, uh, we're down to 38k of memory. So you couldn't waste any resources. So we actually reuse, reuse our memory. And we change existing values. So if you show this to a mathematician, he's going to look at you and say, uh, <clears throat> uh, no. Ah, there's a typo in your formula. X can never, ever, ever be equal to x plus 1, by definition. Right? So this is the mathematical way of looking at it. As it happens, we had found the same, Googled for the same picture. <laughs> so I'm going to show you really a little example of how dangerous variables are to our software and, and for our brain, and how hard it is to cope with them. So, so we get the task of programming this function f of x, which is x plus 1 times x plus 2, which is fairly simple. Now, I made a slightly contrived Python program here to, to show it. It involves no global state, no global variables of sorts. It has only local variables. And I've written it in a slightly funny way. So I say, well, f of x is x equals x plus 1, y equals x plus 1. And I don't know if you noticed. Uh, but uh, return x times y, and you go, there's a bug in your program. That, um, it's, it's the automatic response we have. We're looking at this. There, there, there's a fault. That's not the formula we programmed. And, and then we go, like, yeah, but OK, I incremented x. So now x is actually x plus 1 is that, is x plus 1 plus 1. So they have, OK, it's, it's right. It's correct. But it's, it's intuitively hard to read this code for one single reason. It's because I'm changing x. I'm updating the value of x. What, what is worse is that if I, if I flip two lines in my code, I have a bug. Because I have introduced a completely artificial time dependence into my code. Line A, line 1 must happen before line 2. Otherwise, it's wrong. So now I have x, times, x plus 1 times x plus 1, and not x, times, x plus 1 times x plus 2. Oops. And the only reason for this is that I'm using a variable. I'm updating a value. 
which should be a stable thing. So now if I sort of recast this into a more sensible form, I say, well, I can't change x. So I say a equals x plus 1, b equals a plus 1. And now you see, oh, now suddenly you see a, what was a? Oh, a was, and I can just put in the definition of that in there, and dun, 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 everything is nice. And I can flip the two lines, and it will be, in some language, it will be a compile time error. Uh, in Python, it would be a runtime error, and I would be in, in dire straits. But at least it would be an error. Now, if you imagine in the previous example that x and y were some methods in uh, base class A and B, and I'm working in, in you know, class C, uh, and you have no idea it's somebody else's problem, and you don't know how they work, and you shouldn't know, uh, and you flip two lines in your code, and suddenly, you know, it's, the, it's some, some rocket on its way to the space station that just plummets out of the sky, just because so this is, this is pretty serious. So that's why I'm saying variable updates are really dangerous, and you need to take the right precautions. And here's a picture of me at work preparing to mutate a variable. You have to use the proper protective kit, you know, gear for that. The other thing, uh, apart from data, that we need to worry about, um, is composition. Composition is building complexity from simple things. So you start with something really simple, you plug them together, you get something simple but slightly more complicated. And then go on and go on. And for functions, if you're a mathematician, you can say, well, f of g of x, they have their own notation, is, is identical to f little circle g of x, which we can just say is a function h of x. And we've all done it. You do this all the time. We've all written stuff like print cosine of exponent of minus 1. And we constantly print something other than a value. We compose functions. And if you're a F-sharp programmer, you can write this statement in this way, minus 1 forward pipe exp, forward pipe cos, forward pipe print. Which might look a little bit funny. How many of you are Unix, Linux users? Have used the shell? No, not many? There's one guy, two, right? If you, if Unix users are, uh, should be familiar, vaguely familiar with this. Unix, at its heart, is built around tiny, tiny little programs that do one thing and do it well. And then it has the pipe operator, which allows us to take the, the output of the previous command and use it as input for the next command. And as long as the sort of inputs and outputs are, are sensible and match, you can start building up these more and more and more complex things. And I think it's quite remarkable that Unix was invented in like 1972. At its heart today, the, the core idea of Unix has not changed. It's the same as in 1972. Now, if you think about what has happened with computers since 1972 and the technology, I find it uh, quite stunning. And I think the only reason why the Unix has been so successful is because of this idea. At its heart, Unix is designed around functional principles, which gives it enormous flexibility and stability. So, um, data. Interestingly, data composes as well. And it is important to stretch that data has representation, not implementation. So, so sort of, we can, we can write down a list in a, in a JSON file, or we can have it as a linked list in the computer. And that, that's, that's not really important how, how, sort of, how it's represented. But the thing is, data composes. If I have two lists, I can add two lists, and I get a new list. So the sum of the of two lists there, one, two, three, plus four, five, is just a list, one, two, three, four, five. Same thing goes for dictionaries. 
So I have a dictionary containing ice cream uh, flavor vanilla, uh, and I have another dictionary which contains vehicle van. I can add these together, and now I suddenly modeled an ice cream van. Now, if we go to object-oriented programming, and we ask ourselves the same question: How do we, how do how do objects compose? Well, they don't, in general, unless you define the composition. But you have to code it. It's not there automatically. So if I have an ice cream object, uh, and I have a van object, and I say, well, ice cream object plus van object, what do I get? Well, I have to implement it. And then I get my ice cream van. And then I want to compose that with something, and uh, it doesn't compose, so I have to implement it again. It doesn't scale. It's a lot of work. And there's a lot of, lot of code. I used to do a lot of C++ programming. Oh God, how tedious it was. Every time I oh, create a new class, can I avoid it? Because I knew I had to write the constructor, the copy constructor, the const copy constructor, the equals operator, and I ended up with 600 lines of code before I even got to the problem, every time. The final little piece that we are missing is abstraction. The dictionary definition is the quality of dealing with ideas rather than events. Or the ability to generalize from specific cases. Reuse, in essence. Somebody said, first you should learn how to write usable code, and then you can try to make it reusable. It's also the ability to identify and express patterns. And Peter Norvig famously said that design patterns are bug reports against your language. Peter Norvig is the head of research at Google. So I'm going to make a slight comparison about from functional programming uh, and uh, object-oriented programming. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that object-oriented programming is bad. Uh, it isn't. But the way we're doing it is not necessarily is the soundest way to, to do it. But it has some very good features to it as well. So, object-oriented pattern or principle. Well, single re responsibility principle. Well, the FP equivalent functions. Open-closed principle functions. Dependency inversion principle functions. Interface segregation principle. In functional programming, we use functions and higher-order functions. Factory pattern, well, higher order functions. Strategy pattern, well, yeah, functions. This is the pattern, functions, and so on and so on. And the fact is that in, in, in the functional programming community, most design patterns are so trivial that they don't have any names. Nobody ever thought of them as you know, like design pattern or anything. It's, you, you look at it and you're like, oh, function. It's just the most natural thing to do. So, so this is basically sort of the case why I think this is, for me, uh, uh, this was sort of, it spoke to me. But what does it mean in practice? Here's an example. Uh, this is a real, real life example. It's not mine, unfortunately. I stole it from a guy called uh, Simon Cousins, and there's a link there. You can, um, if you want to read the whole story. Um, E.ON, big power company, uh, German power company, they had a system which was very complicated. So the, the, the inherent complexity of it was large. It was a 500-page PDF specification of power company, blah, blah, stuff that they need to monitor. So the E.ON said, whoa, we have to have this for the EU. So they had C, eight uh, C-sharp developers working for five years, and they implemented 90% of this specification. And it was going slower and slower and slower and slower, and they realized they're going to need another five years, perhaps, to get, to get to, the, to the end. They had produced 350,000 lines of C-sharp code. And they were in the dire straits. So they, Somebody brave, some brave person in the company said, well, uh, get this Simon guy. Uh, take one from the guy from the original team. He didn't know any F-sharp. These two guys sat down. They worked for seven months, two developers, implemented 
100% of the specification in 30,000 lines of code. Now, if he said, well, we want to be sort of fair, and then the lines of number of useful code was 160,000, but then they were down to 16 when they removed the tests and they removed everything. Um, so, um, and uh, for, for me, that's, uh, I mean, if, you, if you're in, interested in, in, in the business side of things, I think this, is, this, this speaks to, to that at least. Uh, Simon sort of just said, well, their code could have served, as, would have fit on the blank lines in the original code and could have served as proper comments to what it was supposed to be doing. So with that, I will conclude. And um, with two uh, uh, quotes, one is from uh, Eskar Dijkstra, who said that simplicity is the prerequisite of reliability. And I can mention in a previous example, that system has been running now for three or four years, and they have not yet received a single bug report on it. And the other quote I have is that simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. And that was Leonardo da Vinci who said it. So try to make things simple. Simple, simple, simple. And I'll uh, just put up my reference, because most of this stuff I stole from somewhere else. Thank you. And please come to my uh, technical session. We're going to do some real hands-on coding with that sharp.